Thank you, Matthias. Thank you uh, to this young fellow, because it's, I think it's important to have young fellows and very bright fellows. You did a fantastic job so far, and I'm sure that you will continue. So really, congratulations. And if I speak of this young fellow, it's because they are still young. And one day, they will become old, and eventually senes. And when you senes, you senes, and there's plenty of sign of senescence. You have senescence, and then sometimes you can see this type of senescence. And for one individual, you can see some sign outside or inside. And in, as dermatologist, of course, we see the skin. And we see the skin, and we can see the keratinocyte, fibrosis. But you can also see, basically, your hair grain. Oops. Uh -huh. You told me it was difficult. It is. Yes, and uh, so basically here, uh, I don't want to introduce this gentleman, but you know this person, and some person are becoming white or younger than others, and it it's also means that you have some genetic components who just help you to grow earlier than others. So that's also something which is important. And then if I want to speak of this, it's just because, of course, we don't have to, to forget the, the definition of senescence is to grow old. And I hope that you will grow old. I don't know if you will lose your hairs, like some people, or if you will become white, dear Maria. But whatever, I do hope that you will go away with this. And then that is the first natural sign of senescence. And I will keep this as an example to, to move on. And also, uh, there is also type of senescence, which is also inducing some air whitening. And that's certainly important. It's associated with oops, I will do it. associated with stress induced, drug induced, or oncogenic inactivation inducing apoptosis. And that is certainly of importance. And if I show you this slide, it's because we are in Austria, and I'm sure that you recognize Marie Antoinette, who was our for last uh, queen in France. And unfortunately, one day she became fully white. Is it the myth or the legend? But clearly, I'm sure that she was very stressed. And then in, in, in any case, if it's a myth or a legend, it doesn't matter what is important, that I'm sure that she became white very fast due to the stress associated with her future, which was kind of dark, unfortunately for her. Uh, and then, basically, it is important that also that we realize that we have these two types of senescence leading to the same consequences air whitening, but as I said, it's for the melanocytes, but it can be for any cell types. And then at, at that time, the consequence would be different from, for one individual different, according to the time for different cell type. So how can we explain that? So basically, we have some, the natural whitening is associated with the telomere attrition, and that is from f -Lick, and it was done with some uh, experiment in vitro, and then we'll come back to this. And basically, it's associated with replicative senescence. And then basically, it's associated with the exhaustion of myocyte stem cells in vivo. And that's something that is important to realize. So immediately, when we say, see the stress whitening, it's not associated with the telomere. And then basically, at least in part, but it's clear that we do have this, we have some destruction or handicapped melanocyte stem cells. And therefore, they cannot do their job in the future. Either they cannot differentiate, or either they can not migrate where they should migrate, and so forth, and so on, or early differentiate where they should not differentiate. But in any case, there is a premature senescence. So already, from something which is simple, just being old, then you, you see the differences at the, uh, at the cellular level, and that is certainly, and we become to something which is kind of important. As you understand, this kind of things is irre irreversible, and this is something that is important to realize. You will be old and older and older, but unfortunately, you will not be become younger. And that's something that is important in this context, and you will understand very fast why I'm saying this. And then, basically, we have to, to, to realize these issues. So, nicely, with the mice, we can have exactly the same thing. We have also some natural aging that we can't see naturally on black six mice, 
but we can see that on certain background. And then playing with the different genes, and I will not give you a lot of examples that we did in the, in, 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 the, in the lab, but I just want to give you an example that we, we did in collaboration with Frido Bierman. It was one of the first ones that we did. Uh, and it's basically with notch one and notch two. Then this mouse just gray regularly with time to become white at 31 weeks. But intermediately, you had some uh, dark gray, light gray to white. And then it's a very slow process. Here we have a stress uh, that I took this from uh, uh, Emini Shimura. Uh, uh, and then she basically uh, irradiated, irradiated the, the mice with ionizing uh, treatment. And then basically you do have a whitening of, of the mice. And that is associated with the stress that I was speaking of. So now we have something else. We have something else which is associated with the oncogene-induced senescence. And that is something that is very important to realize. It's, and then we are already different because we're the stem cells in the business and so forth and so on. We do have some giant nevis, and that is congenital. And there it's, a, it's a photo that I took from a, a paper with a Wernicke that we just published. And this, this child just showed a ma major and uh, massive uh, giant nevis. And these guys are associated with a mutation in NRAS. It's nras 361 k in this case. And you have also another type of oncogene induced senescence, which is associated with a nevi that can rise late uh, during development or, uh, or later on. And that they are mainly, and you can see all of them, which are associated with a mutation in BRAF. In this case, it's BRAF 600E. So what you can see is that we have two types of nevi. When it's associated with development, it's associated with NRAS. When it's not associated with uh, uh, development, it's BRAF. And then I will go to this in a second. So basically, Frido Bierman just generated some mice which were mutated for NRAS. And you have a specific expression of NRAS, a mutated form of NRAS. I will learn. Uh, uh, which is specifically. Uh, expressed in the, in, the, in the mineral sites. And this mouse is basically a giant nevis. And that is what, is a, what we have right now. So we can mimic with the mice what we have in, in, vivo, in, in humans. Now we can ask to ourselves, what would happen if we induce the mutation early on with BRAF in the mice? So that we did that. And for this, we just did some molecular biology and then used uh, the, the uh, BRAF wild type, which is uh, occurring before the defluxing of, uh, of the gene, and then after defluxing with tyrosine gray, then at that point, you generate the mutated form of uh, BRAF, BRAF V600E. And that this occurs in melanocytes from E9.5 during development. It's mid-gestation. And then what we do see is that these mice present a lot of dramatic uh, malformation. You see that at the meninges, and then they do divide a lot, as you can see here, it's sky 67 We see that the eye is abnormal, and also the heart is abnormal. And we know that we do have melanocytes in the heart. Therefore, in the presence of active proliferation of these myocytes in the heart, then you disturb the formation of the heart, and in consequence, this animal die around birth and uh, just after birth. So basically, these, these guys may survive for a while, but they, they do die. And it's certainly the reason that we have rarely some mutation of BRAF in giant nevi. I don't say that we don't have any BRAF mutation in giant nevi. We do. But certainly, this mutation arises very late in some clones in, in, in mineral sites, and that's why we, we can see them. But of course, now we can also wonder can we generate some nevi when we generate a mutation of BRAF after birth in order that we don't have any congenital uh, problem? And that we did that uh, uh, in collaboration with uh, Richard Murray. And that it's uh, basically, we use the Tarot Square Attitude that we generated a while ago, and we induced tamoxifen after birth. So basically, in his lab and in my lab, we don't have exactly the same result, not 
qualitatively, but quantitatively, in the timing, but we had exactly the same, same, same result overall. If I'm saying this, it's because now we know why it's going on. We know that the flora and the fauna of the animal colony is very important for the timing. So when you have differences between labs, then at that point, you must not forget at least the microbiome that you are dealing with. So in any case, that's not the point, that we generate some nice nevi in this mice, and then here you can see that the, the, the nevi at 14 months old is the same here. Nothing is moving for these guys. And the same here. So basically, we can mimic nicely what we have in, uh, in mice, what we have in, in, in humans. So that these models are kind of nice because we can really reproduce what we have in, 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 viv in vivo in, in humans. So, of course, when we want to understand a, a, a mechanism, it's important to get the cell because in vivo it's very difficult to address this and that you, uh, all of us know that. So, basically, that I'm, sh I'm presenting you some establishment of melanocytin culture in the lab, and then basically the cells are dividing. That's diff th th three different um, uh, mouse. And first they, they grow nicely, and they arrive at the plateau, which is the start to senes. This, we generated this in, in the lab, but we know that from 40, 50 years, I mean, maybe even 60 years, that when you establish cell in culture, they do divide for a certain time, and they arrive at the plateau. And that was associated with the f -leak, what was observed in human cells for the telomere. It's not the case for the mouse because they do not have these issues. In, in humans, basically, you go through two main issues, the telomere and the cell cycle. In, in mouse, you don't have any problem with the telomere, you have a problem just with the cell cycle. In any case, we can play with this mouse, uh, with these cell lines. No, it's not cell line yet, but it's primary culture, sorry. And then basically, we just can take a look at what is happening to these cells. So the first thing is at the beginning when they divide, they are BRDU positive and they become BRDU negative. And you see that they're very large. The nuclei is, is larger, you have the, you can see the, 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 the modification of the nucleus uh, that we will see in a second. What we can see also, it's another issue is you do activate a beta-galactosidase, which is specific of, uh, the, uh, of the mammals, which is working only in uh, acidic condition. And these cells are producing uh, an enzyme, which is the SA beta-galactosidase, and it's revealing by the blue staining. And also, that already, I, I mentioned this already, you do have a major chromatin reorganization. So that, there are criteria to explain the senescence. But as you can imagine, these criteria, are they fantastic? Do they represent everything? Are all the senescents go through the same system? We have to be very careful about this. We have to also think of the, uh, of the condition of that and, and the consequence of what we are saying. And if I'm saying this, it's because many people are arguing on the validity of this assay for SA beta gal, but in, in any case, it is important to think ahead of what is senescence and all the difference. And same, same, but different. And it's uh, just to... <laughs> uh, so basically we have to think of that. So that is a cellular level we can see that very, uh, in an easy manner. You can play that also in vivo. You see exactly the same criteria. That we can see that in, uh, in, uh, in, in humans, and then people saw that a, a while ago. But we can also see that in the BRF mice. So basically, our cells are in the nevi are blue, they are large, and so forth. They have all the char characteristics of senescent cells. We have also some other criteria, and that we go to the molecular aspect now, which are associated with the senescence associated secretory phenotype. So basically, the senescent cells are informing the surrounding, I'm senescent. And then they're informing the, re the surrounding, for what reason, don't ask me, but they do. And then basically, they, they, they just produce different things. And that is certainly important for cell-cell communication. What is happening? What is the consequence of this, uh, of this communication? Do they induce the senescence of the other one? Do they induce the migration? Do they call the immune system, please kill me? 
and so forth and so on. So there's a lot of dialogues here, and then we have to better understand what is going on with the different stages of Senescence. Of course, before Senescence, that many other, other cellular mechanisms may occur. You have also the DNA damage response, which is important to appreciate. I spoke already of the DNA image through the ionization. I spoke of the telomer erosion, and then when you have a high level of rust, then you induce the DNA damage, and when you, you have a very low level of MITF, you have also a DDR. MITF is a key transcription factor of the myocyte lineage, and its function depends on the quantity and the activity. When you have a very low level of uh, MITF, you induce the senescence. When you have a certain level of MITF, you induce the proliferation. When you have a higher level of, of, uh, of MITF, you induce differentiation. I just simplify because you have plenty of other uh, cellular mechanisms associated with the activity of MITF. In any case, when you induce the DDR, you induce two proteins which are very important and that you know this, uh, this protein which is associated with the locus of cd 2 a and P53. And then when you induce this, poof, you induce senescence. That, again, we can speak of that and see the limit of it. So let's go through the cd 2 a locus. What is kind of interesting? On this locus, you have four exons. You have two common exons, exon two and exon three, and you have two exons which are independent, and you have independent transcription star size. You have the P16, which is transcribed from exon 1A, and half, P14 or P19, depending on the species, that is coming from, X, uh, from X1B. You do have an alternative splice from X1B to exon 2, and then to exon 3. You do use the same part of exon 2, which is kind of dangerous when we think of the evolution, because you have a mutation, then you will mutate both proteins. And maybe it's a very good way just to avoid any problem, because you just have a lethality during embryonic development. The second point also I have to mention, you do have different uh, off, and that's important because the protein will be different. These two proteins have different uh, activity, and then P14, P19 is, is inducing P53, which is repressing CDK, CDK2, which is active on, uh, on RB. And RB is important to control the cell cycle. And then we have the same thing for P16, and then you go through CDK4 and 6, and you go also through RB. So basically, these two proteins are important to control the cell cycle through RB. So now, when we take a look on many, many uh, cell types, very often P53 is important, P16 is less important. And in, in other cell type, it's the opposite. And it is the case of the myocytes. P16 seems much more important in the process, at least during initiation, uh, to, induce, uh, to induce the cell cycle arrest. <coughs> what is important now, I told you that Senescence was irreversible. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem to be the case all the time. It seems that it's reversible in certain aspects because you can bypass this senescence by the oncogene induced senescence. It is true when you have a giant navy. I'm not saying that it's very common. I'm not saying it's very often. No, it's not the case, but it may happen. For the BRAF, it's the same thing. We may have some nevi would just transform in, in melanoma. Again, is it frequent? No, hopefully, but that may happen also. And that we have exactly the same thing with the NRAS mice or the BRAF mice. We may have some melanoma from these guys and melanoma from these guys as well. And I want to insist on the fact that we are speaking of senescence and we are not speaking of quiescence. I'm not speaking of slow dividing cells which are different again. I even don't speak of the dormant cells or the resting cells. And that's why it's very important to try to better understand what is in the back of all these, uh, the, these terms, and because we have to put a term on something at one moment, of course. So, 
now we know that we can induce melanoma when we have a mutation with NRAS or BRAF, even though we induce the senescence, even though we bypass the senescence. So how can we bypass the senescence? That's so basically it's a very, this scheme of course, I'd like to show it because it's fully wrong, but it's, it's, it shows you how, how it may work. You do induce the proliferation, you do induce the immortalization. If I use the word immortalization, it's because it's a very old term, and now we use bypass of senescence. But immortalization, just to tell you that it may be immortal in culture, in vitro, and that's why EFLIC was, was, was important in the business. And then I will not speak of the progression or the formation of the metastasis. I showed you the growth of these melanocytes before. I stopped here the week 16, and in general, the cells are just disappearing with time. Sometimes, there's some cells found the, the trick to be immortal, to, be, to bypass the senescence, and that, how do they do that? It takes a long time. I mean, it takes about 20 weeks, and it's only very few cells who find the tricks, the, one way or another. When we take a look very closely on, on the culture, what we can see is that the vast majority of the cells are senescent. They are big, they are flat, they are full of melanin, and they are P16 positive. But we may also see some cells which are becoming very small, not much differentiated. They are Ki67 positive, they are BRDU positive, and they are P16 negative. And that you can see that here and there, and these cells are able to, to grow. And these cells will move on and you will establish some cell lines from that. So now, that is what is happening. So we wanted to know, okay, we have P16, which other gene or protein could do the job? And then we were interested to understand better the regulation of P16 and P19, and know if it was going through P19 or P16. So we, we started with beta catenin for various reasons, and then basically we, we generated some mice which were mutated for beta catenin that we call beta cat star. And then when we established the myocyte in culture, these cells are very easy to, to go in culture. So they know how to do it. And then they, they, they find their way very fast. So we did the same thing with P10, in the lack of P10, same game. So now, Let's take a look on what is going on for P16 with these cells. Here in blue, you do have the wild type, and in red, the mutant for beta catenin. But again, we have the same thing with P10. Here, after two weeks, we do see different cell types. We have some TAPI, which is here, so two melanocytes, as you can recognize by MITF positive, and the fact they are expressing a melanin. And you have fibroblast. In our condition, when we establish melanocyte in culture, we have keratinocytes at the beginning fibroblasts, and melanocytes. In our condition, the keratinocytes are not growing, so that's not there. The only problem is the fibroblast, and then we have to find some tricks to eliminate at, uh, the fibroblast, but we, we can do it. And then basically what you do, you do see that the, the wild-type melanocyte, they're producing P16. When you take a look at six weeks of age, then you still express uh, P16. But only at 20 weeks, then at that point, the cells which are able to grow, the small cells I was showing you, are P16 negative. The big cells continue to express P16. Now, when we take a look for beta catenin, you do see that this uh, fibroblast is P16 positive, but the two MITF positive cells are negative for P16. Also, you can see the difference of shape of the, of the myocyte just uh, on this immunofluorescence. And of course, they, they, with, with time, the P16 do not appear again. So basically, beta catenin knows how to repress very efficiently P16. So, I, we know that the MAP kinase pathway is important to initiate the proliferation. We know that BRAF is important, NRAS. We also have NF1, KRAS, and HRAS. According to what I told you, P16, that we knew that in the past, is important for the bypass of senescence. I showed you here now for beta catenin for P10. I don't show you for MDM4, but it's also the case for P53. I wanted to concentrate on, uh, on, the, on, the, on the P16 pathway. 
So when we take a look on the mice, when we have the CDKN2A that was uh, generated by uh, Manuel Serrano, these mice, which are lacking P16 and P19, do not form any melanoma. When we do express specifically an oncogenic form of beta catenin in the melanoma sites, they don't form any melanoma. If there is only one, one phenotype, is the, 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 the mice on black cysts are lighter than normal, so you inhibit proliferation, that's it. And then when you remove P10 from these mice, they are absolutely normal. So now, we wanted to have the common match and the proper match between the, the proper oncogene and the proper tumor suppressor in order to see what was going on. And then, basically, we looked at in, 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 in tumors, if in human tumors, do we have mutation for BRAF and do we have mutation for P16? It was the case. And then we crossed these mice together in order to see what is going on. Here we have a Kaplan Mayer with the disease free. The BRAF onc flux without tamoxifen, of course, there is no leak. When you just put the BRAF onc, then at that moment, you do have some 50%, you need about 10 months to get some melanoma. And then when you cross the mice with P16, you need only five months. So that's one thing, it's basically you reduce the latency period. The second thing is that the penetrance is much higher. So you do have a cooperation with BRAF and P16. For NRAS and beta catenin the game is a bit different because we took a look again what was going on in humans. And what we do see is that, in fact, NRAS and beta catenin when NRAS is mutated, you have more chance to have beta catenin which is upregulated in, 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 the, in, in the nucleus, which is not the case for BRAF or for the wild-type tumors. And therefore, we were very interested into this. And then we, we did the mice. And then, of course, we had exactly the same results. Latency period reduced, penetrance was induced. We continue with NRAS and P10. NRAS and P10, many people were saying, oh, that's exhausted. It's absolutely not true. It's not exhaustive. And then at that moment, you do the same thing. And that you have also the same results. So of course, I would love to tell you all the molecular mechanism, but uh, Matthias is there just to remind me that the time is running and I'm late and I do apologize. So very fast, if, if I may. Uh, so basically, beta catenin is interacting with uh, the catherine, which is allow the cell-cell contact. Naturally, caveolin is coming with, to interact with beta catenin, and then you do have a normal, and, uh, normal internalization of the system. In the presence of P10, at that moment, P10 is kicking out, kick, kicking out uh, beta catenin from caveolin and bring back caveolin to, uh, to the membrane, and ecatrin and, and beta catenin go back to the, to the cells, and then it's normal, everything is fine. Now, when, you, when P10 is not there anymore, then at that moment, what you do have is that you do have a in massive internalization of ecatrine and beta catenin, And that induces EMT for epithelial cell, that, that was shown also in the lab. And you have also an iteration of, uh, of this complex in melanocytes. And the consequence is that beta catenin is released from uh, ecatrine and goes to the nucleus. And then you have a switch from left one beta catenin to TCF4 beta catenin, and then in this condition, P16 is repressed. And then at that moment, we put everything together, such as P10, P10 repressed beta catenin, which is repressing P16, which is inducing senescence. So that's at least one part of the game. And I'm sure you've heard this late. Of course, I would like to thank all the, the, the members. I want to specifically thank uh, Veronique, Ver Valérie, which is around, and Isabelle and uh, Alejandro, and also our collaborators. And I thank you for your attention.